You're such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about a music festival that ended in a strange disappearance. A place of pure joy resulted in so much sadness. Nothing was making sense. Stories were being changed and suspicions were high, but the theories were the craziest part of all. If you don't know, it's my absolute passion to tell these stories. I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that's something you would like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on and giving this video a thumbs up and leave a nice comment down below. I also want to thank our sponsor Surfshark. Now Surfshark is the easiest way to keep your internet not only safe but private. All the information as well as the location where you are using the internet is protected. It's basically blurred from the outside world. It also has an antivirus feature and that covers all of your devices because once you get a subscription you can actually have it cover every single device you own which is so, so nice. My favorite part of Surfshark is being able to pretend you are anywhere in the world from the comfort of your own home. So you can watch different shows that aren't in your regular location. You can go on different websites. You can get different deals. It's all around such a wonderful thing and you get to be as safe online as you are in real life as well. And Surfshark is by far the easiest VPN I've ever used. The complexity part of it is on their end and then you get the super easy part and I have just been loving it even though I've tried so many other VPNs. So if you would like to try it, you can just go to surfshark.deals slash brook or enter promo code brook for 83% off as well as three extra months for free. That's 83% off. So make sure you go and get that deal because it's so good. But thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2018 in Michigan and Kevin Graves was from Highland Township and he was a 27 year old mechanic and he was actually working as a machine operator at that time. He had started this career because his father had done so as well. He was known to be this tall, lanky guy. He was as strong as a bull, but he was not an aggressive man. Even though he could pretty much outfight anybody, he wasn't going to use that. He wasn't aggressive, he wasn't assertive, he wasn't angry. He was really kind of an emotional guy. He was not afraid to show his emotions. He would let tears run out and his family knew him as a kind and gentle soul. His family though were everything to him. He adored his parents, especially. He would call his mother every single day. He would visit his father several times a week. He was always in communication with his sister, Kelly, who was older than him and had a few kids herself whom he loved. He was just such an empathetic individual. It kind of surprised people how emotional he could be. Kevin, when he wasn't working, also loved music and partying, and he often went with friends or his girlfriend, who was Kayla Covington. Now, he and his girlfriend did live together at the time. She had two kids from a previous relationship and Kevin was there you know taking care of them too but they lived together and they would often go out and be together as well and one of the huge things that they loved to do was concerts as well as festivals just large amounts of people that were enjoying the music together and one of the biggest happened to be only three hours away from where they lived this was in Rothbury Michigan and it had been started 10 years ago prior. At that point it was the Rothbury Festival and back then it was just kind of rock bands and then it gradually moved to just electronic music. But the festival was a full weekend long then and it had since become two weekends long and you could choose one or the other to be able to go to. They also had campsites where you could just set up a tent and just you know stay there for the nights on this 2,000 acre place where the festival was being held or there was a double JJ resort that you could also also buy rooms for as well. Just a year prior, it had been nominated for Festival of the Year, so they were so excited to go. It was going to be Kevin, Kayla, and two of their friends who were Angel and James, who was a female and a male, but they were not together. They were just friends with everybody. But they had to choose between the weekend of June 21st through the 24th or June 28th through July 1st. And they decided on the second weekend, and performing there would be Bass Nectar, Marshmallow, Lewis the Child, The Glitch Mob, and many more. They bought these tickets which were going to be around $300 each. And then Kevin's father actually helped Kevin kind of put back together his car, make sure it was ready to go for the weekend because he was actually going to be driving. 
And his father said that Kevin just kept talking about how happy he was that he was going to go because they had never been before. And he was just so, so pumped to leave. They arrived on June 27th, excited for the weekend to come. This was the night before the actual festival began, but they were just so excited and they had brought a tent and they would be camping on the festival grounds. However, by the end, Michigan State Police would be involved. That July 1st, the last day of the festival, Kevin's girlfriend, Kayla, had called the police to say that he had vanished. Now, she claimed that they had an argument that day around 2 p.m., and then he said he was going to go back to the tent just to cool off, and they went back to the festival, her and the friends. And so when they got back to the tent, they found he was not there. And so they started kind of looking around and they weren't finding him anywhere. He wasn't coming back to the tent. And so they actually called Kevin's parents and told them what was going on. And that is when Kayla was urged to call the police. His girlfriend calls and says, I can't find Kevin. I don't know what do you mean you can't find Kevin? Apparently they got in some argument, according to the people that were there. And I think, he saw something. That's my gut. The security on site were made up of off-duty police officers, so it wasn't hard to get help, but it was going to be hard to locate him. He wasn't the only one to vanish either because Michigan State Police were informed that a 21-year-old vanished at the festival as well. He was from Athens, Alabama, and he was thought to have gone missing on June 30th, a day prior to Kevin's disappearance. His name was Zach Greason, and he had an abandoned car at the festival. He and Kevin both had very light hair, light eyes, but and tattoos as well. But Zach was a bit smaller at 5'6", weighing 165 pounds, whereas Kevin was 6 foot, weighing 185 pounds. Zach's tattoos actually read slut on his upper right shoulder and he had a whisker tattoo on his right index finger, whereas Kevin's tattoo was on the opposite shoulder and had USMC. Now at this point, investigators kind of separated their investigations while keeping in mind that they had both finished from this festival and they both were given phone numbers that people could call in for tips. And this is also when investigators prepared to search the grounds. Now this was proving to be difficult at Electric Forest because most people who had their stuff on the campgrounds who were at the actual festival were beginning to pack up or had already left because the festival was over. And so the cleanup was in process and a lot of the evidence or, you know, different pieces of clues were being picked up and just thrown away. There were dozens of volunteers who helped as well as dive teams for the nearby lake. Investigators had canines, but it was so difficult when everybody who was in the area, any possible witnesses, had already gone or they were too intoxicated or on drugs to be able to actually help. Nearly 45,000 people had been in attendance at Electric Forest, and so investigators hoped, maybe because there were so many people, their friends just weren't able to locate them because it was such a big crowd. And so they panicked, they called the police, and they would easily find them once everybody started leaving. They would just emerge from there, but this would only occur for one. By July 11th, which was 10 days after Kevin's disappearance, investigators got a call from Zach's father. And he was actually saying that Zach was home and he was alive and well. Apparently he had either forgotten about his car or just decided that he was too intoxicated to drive it, but he made his way home. Yet it would not be that easy for Kevin Graves' family. Now, when his credit card accounts were obtained, it showed that on July 1st, he actually withdrew $200, which was a large sum in his account. But after that, there was no activity. However, since he disappeared, all of the money in the account had been drained. Kayla said this was because they actually had the count for both of them and she was using that money to pay off his loan so he didn't get behind while he was gone. As the search continued, they had to believe that they were looking for a body and investigators continued to search a second time, a third time, and third time was the charm, as many say, and in this case as well, because a witness would come up to them and say that she thought 
that she had seen their missing man and she said that it was in the San Morocco's Mexican restaurant on July 4th, three days after he disappeared, that he was alive but he was kind of under the influence of drugs or, and, or something and he was also on the phone of the restaurant arguing with someone. She had also seen him outside begging for food and money. A few investigators did decide to go ahead and skip out on that search to go and see if they could corroborate this witness's statement and that is when they found that the restaurant was only actually 10 miles away from the actual festival and they were able to locate an employee who said yeah there had been a man here he was barefoot he was wearing dirty tan shorts and he was on the phone for about a half hour both witnesses said that Kevin or this man had said my girlfriend and her dad dumped me here. Now from what I could find, Kayla's dad was not at the festival. However, some sources that I have watched have claimed that he was. So we cannot be certain about that. But <clears throat> this was now two victims corroborating each other's story. And even though Kevin's family couldn't be certain this was actually him, it gave them hope that he was alive. They began offering a reward of $10,000 for any information and they were getting calls but most of them turned out to be scam artists and when they would ask for the information they would say well give us iTunes gift cards and then we'll tell you. And these scam artists made the investigation even harder for everyone. But then another witness claimed that they had seen Kevin at 2 p.m. at the festival and he was at the first aid station for a while and then another witness said around that time he was also at his tent and he was crying. Kayla said that he was taking drugs, psychedelic drugs that are often passed around at these festivals and his family went on to talk to the public hoping to reach out to him saying that they did not care you know what he had done where he was they just wanted to know that he was okay and he could continue being wherever he was they just wanted him to reach out so they would know and the thing was the family knew that he had often suffered with depression that he was actually dealing with some sort of substance abuse and he'd also stopped taking his medication about two months prior for bipolar because he said it made him lethargic. I knew there would be uh, drugs and stuff up there. I knew that was going to happen and I told him, you know, be careful, don't, you know, get yourself hooked up on something that you're going to regret, you know. And he said, no, nah, I'm just going to go up there to have a good time, Dad. But they also knew, even with all of this, he would never leave his family behind. They knew that for certain. And before he had vanished, his sister Kelly actually got a text from him, and it was saying that everything was good and he loved her the most. They had plans to talk the next Monday, and his last text sent was actually to his father, where he was saying that he was paying him back, or he was going to soon, for a small loan that he had gotten from his father. He didn't explain how, his father wasn't asking for this, and he said he was just kind of acting strange while talking to him. All it said was, Dad, I love you for your service. I love you, and someday I will pay you back everything I owe you. And that was the last thing I heard from him, and I texted him back and I never got no answers back. Kayla told investigators that Kevin had been acting odd all weekend, that he accused her of cheating with James, the friend that had come with them, and that he also believed she had called the FBI on him. She was allegedly given a polygraph test about having to, anything to do with this, and she passed, and she said that she and her friends believed he wanted to leave, and that basically it wasn't her problem if he didn't want to be with her anymore. At this point, Kayla wouldn't give phone records to the family for quite a long time, and no one really knew why. She had the phone records because it was actually in her family's name, and so she had to acquire them and give them to the family, which was providing to be difficult for no reason. Now, the family said that she did help for quite a while. She was calling different places, she was on the search teams, but she had suddenly cut off all communication, blocked them on everything, and stopped helping with the search altogether. She had told the family that she couldn't deal with everybody blaming her, calling her horrible things, but the family said they never, they never personally called her anything, believed she was guilty, and they told her, you know, we cannot do anything about what they're saying, but we do need your help. Now, some sources say that she did write a Facebook status saying he suffers from depression and bipolar and I think had a manic episode or psychosis or something. And her own father, who had actually lived with Kayla and Kevin, had since come out saying that Kevin had insinuated not wanting to come home or not coming home after the festival before they left. 
Kevin's sister Kelly was actually the first to get in contact with Angel and James who were also with them at the festival and asked them questions. They both seemed to answer. She found nothing suspicious about them, but they had not been questioned at all by the police. Investigators had found though that one of Kevin's friends was also in the area. This was not somebody who he went to the festival with. This man did not go to the festival, but he was from California. And he was actually staying at the Roadway Inn, which was just right next to the San Marcos Mexican restaurant. When they went to search this area, they could find nobody inside the room. His phone seemed to be shut off, but they did find a pair of dirty tan shorts outside, like the witnesses from the restaurant were saying that this man who looked like Kevin was wearing. When they tried to locate Kevin's friend, you know, his phone was off. They couldn't talk to him, and it's believed that nothing more came from this finding. That is when news broke that another festival attendee had died. This was 27-year-old Hunter Lurie, who had been at the festival for, as a vacation from his job. He actually worked as an assistant director on commercials. He was from a very successful Hollywood family. His father was Rob Lurie, who was a Hollywood writer and director. And on July 1st, the day that Kevin had vanished, Hunter was actually taken to the hospital after collapsing. He had gone into cardiac arrest and he passed the next day. The extreme heat was a concern for festival, you know, representatives who were worried that this would cause some deaths or some illness, but this wasn't the fact for Hunter. It actually turned out to be a blood clot. And although this was a tragic accident, it didn't lead to any more theories like investigators were hoping in Kevin's case. By the end of July, more tips were coming in and one witness claimed that she had seen Kevin at an Oregon Gentleman's Club. And when investigators heard this, they asked for surveillance footage and from what I could find, no more was said about this. So I'm assuming it led nowhere. Maybe the family looked at it and it wasn't Kevin. But Kevin's family were staying in the Michigan area this entire time, handing out his missing persons posters. They were asking homeless shelters, hospitals if he was there. They were looking in beaches and on the streets. And that's when there were reports from the different locals. They kind of heard whispers about in the community of their theory. And they believed that Kevin had actually joined the 12 tribes, which most of them believed was a cult. Both Kevin's family and the police were then informed that many believed that he had joined the cult at the festival. You see, the 12 tribes had been formed in the 1970s by Albert Eugene Spriggs in Tennessee to recreate the first century church that's in the book of Acts. They started by holding this mass in the park. They were baptizing people. They were having the elders kind of be the bosses and run the whole thing. And the Citizens Freedom Foundation, which is now the Cult Awareness Network, officially labeled their church as a cult and called Albert their cult leader. However, these leaders, all of the members, ignored the rumors and the elders were teaching the cult members that this was just a ploy to stop them and they referred to it as the cult scare amongst them. Albert was then offered a minister job at a local church hoping to derail his plan and basically make him in the church or make him in the cult that he had formed. However, he declined this. During this time, there was also a man called Ted Patrick who was working on deprogramming cult members from all over the world, any that he could get a hold of. He would release them from the brainwashing done by cult leaders by dissuading them from their strong convictions that they had been taught. He would basically have to physically and psychologically cut them off by throwing members in a van of them and getting them off the commune and then talking to them. Ted was so good at his job that a local detective hired him to deprogram his daughter who had joined the cult. The detective ended up arresting his daughter for a falsified warrant to get her away and then Ted did his magic on her and she was free after that. By this point, the cult was said to be in debt and so they were selling a lot of their churches and they were moving and that's when they went to Vermont. And at this point, the Citizens Freedom Foundation were working double time to try to shut this down and they had allegations of child abuse, of mind control, and they were hoping to end it all. And that's when, in 1983, one of their elders was actually charged with assault by a neighbor and then had multiple child custody cases against him, so this allowed them to get a search warrant. The next year, social services went in and ended up rescuing 112 children. However, the next day, those 112 children were sent back because the raid was deemed unconstitutional. After this, the 12 tribes began to get very nice with their neighbors, hoping that they could dissuade them from calling the police anymore, and they did so because the case was dropped. The elder, who had been the reason this raid even started, actually ended up marrying 
his attorney. And the thing about marrying in the cult is that the courtship often involved a waiting period where this couple had to be judged by the community and where the community would decide if they were a good couple. And then if they decided so, they could engage and finally hold hands prior to marriage. This elder and his new wife began actually going out to the public and talking in front of everybody trying to make them believe the cult wasn't as bad as people had often said it was. They would also talk to ex-cult members who were saying that they had very negative and toxic views in the cult and that it was dangerous and they were trying to talk them out of their thinking. And it was kind of working because where they were in Vermont was under fire for allowing this raid to happen of them, calling it the greatest deprivation of civil liberties in history. And the governor was under fire for weeks afterwards for allowing this to occur. That's when they were officially naming themselves the 12 tribes and they spread all over the world. They're said to have about 3,000 members now, but I believe that there's probably more than that. They believe in a mixture of Christian, Hebrew, and the sacred name movement. They believe that all of those religions have fallen and they will not align with any of them. They said that that's why they use Yeshua as a word for Jesus because it is the nature of Jesus rather than his personality. The 12 tribes also teach three eternal destinies where everyone is given a conscience after death and a second coming is when believers are allowed to come back for a thousand years to reign with Yeshua. And then after that, the non-believers will be judged according to their deeds and separated between righteous and unjust and the unjust go to the lake of fire. Some say that the 12 tribes believe that slavery is necessary, however, they claim that they're not racist and they're also said to believe to be homophobic, misogynistic, and allegedly abuse their children. They've also been charged with child labor and illegal homeschooling and many businesses are actually run by them by the members who are not paid with money but by room and board. This is as well as their Bear Creek Farm where they sell energy bars, granola, and soaps, which is in Michigan where Kevin vanished. To travel, they use two buses, which are named Peacemaker and Peacemaker 2. On the back is a phrase that says, We know the way, we'll bring you home, which is a play on words from the Grateful Dead song, which the lyrics are, If I knew the way, I would take you home. In their free time, they will travel around to different concerts and festival, but it isn't just for fun. It's for a much more sinister reason. You see, 12 tribes would often go to festivals to recruit new members. They wanted young adults to join their cult and come on the buses as a disguise for, you know, recruitment. They would actually use their buses for emergency medical care. There was also a huge welcome sign outside of their bus and they would give out cocoa and tea and cookies in order to have conversations with these people where they would basically manipulate and brainwash them. And they would also hand out flyers that said, we need radical change, and they would speak to the lost souls and make them believe they could be a part of something. Many believe they take vulnerable people and use them to their own advantage, and they believe that fans of any sort of musicians are seekers ready to hear gospel. They also believe that end times have arrived, but they haven't set a date for that yet. But through all of this, they continue to advertise that their communities are for people to visit or stay forever, that you can leave once you enter. Although many have left the cult and have accused them of abusive practices, but in 2019, the FBI did do an investigation and they released some of the information saying that they had found suspicions of child abuse, of deaths, and oddities with spiritual rituals. Now, the founder of this tribe, cult, did pass away in 2021. However, the cult remains alive. Now, Kevin's sister, Kelly, was bombarded with so many messages saying, please look into the 12 tribes. That could be where he was. And telling her that they had seen the Peacemaker buses at Electric Forest. And Kelly's gut told her that that's where he was. And so she went on their website and she ended up talking to one of the members who was a man in Colorado who said he would call around and get back to her. And they have all said, all the members say that, you know, their members don't just disappear off the face of the earth, that you can be in contact with your relatives, that you are not in prison. And this seemed like such a good theory. And so while they were all waiting for him to get back to them, they were all thinking, you know, maybe that's where he is. However, some people, some of his friends began saying that they really didn't think so because you know, they didn't allow alcohol and drug use in this cult. And they were also very religious, whereas Kevin 
was an atheist. Finally, that 12 Tribes member got back in contact with Kelly, and he left her a message saying, Kelly, this is Tim with the 12 Tribes, the community, and Marshall. I lost your phone number, so I'm trying with Facebook. I reached out to one of the communities in New York that keeps up with the Peacemaker's bus whereabouts. Our first Peacemaker has not been roadworthy for years and is presently in repairs. Peacemaker 2 is mostly in Savannah, Georgia for the summer. So I can confirm that no one from the 12 Tribes or the Peacemaker buses were at Electric Forest. I know this doesn't help find your brother, but every little detail can help. If I can be of any other help, don't hesitate to call me. I hope you find your brother, Tim. And obviously, everyone was devastated hearing this because if he was in this cult, no matter what their practices really were, it could mean that he was still alive. But this was yet another theory that was debunked. And at the year anniversary of Kevin's disappearance, his family actually decided to go back to Electric Forest and hand out his missing persons posters at the gate, hoping that somebody had been there last year and would remember something. His father Gary said that he still believes that Kevin is alive because his son is a survivor. And although they didn't get any more information at the gates, another theory has been floating around this case that possibly he now works at a marijuana farm. He was known to be involved with it at home at the festival and he also talked about wanting to grow it too. However, there has been nothing to connect him to any sort of farm or that anyone was there who was hiring anybody. But two years after his disappearance in 2020, there was actually a tip sent to police about a homeless man who resembled Kevin. This was in Holland, Michigan, about an hour away from the festival and where it was held. And they said that he resembled Kevin so much. He had spoke to this homeless man and he knew about Kevin Gray was going missing. And so he didn't speak to the homeless man about it because he didn't want to spook him, but he went to the police. And so one of Kevin's cousins actually went out in the snow to this area to see if he could find him. And that was when he found a bicycle a TP that was kind of like a home with grill, coolers, clothing, a backpack, boxes, as though someone had been living there. There were footsteps going to the campsite, but no one was there. Now, as far as I know, they have never found anybody there and nothing more has happened with this theory either. As of today, it has been four years since he vanished and Kevin Graves is still missing. His identifying tattoos are his USMC on his left shoulder, an Aquarius sign on his right forearm, and red lips on his right hip. And his family still believes he is out there, alive. So if you have any information, even the smallest thing that you saw possibly at the festival, possibly around that area, please call either the Oakland County Sheriff's Office at 248-858-4951 or Michigan State Police at 231-873-2171. The strange thing is the police department working on this case was actually not from where that festival was, where he initially disappeared. It was from where he used to live and they were the ones who picked up this case. And there was a sergeant on the case and his name was Sergeant Bach and he said that he had looked over everything and he did not suspect the girlfriend in any way. They weren't married or had kids so she did not have any motive and he believed he just wanted to appear dead. The sergeant didn't want to believe the family who were telling him Kevin used to call us all the time. He wouldn't just leave because he would want to be in contact with us. He said that he didn't believe the family and that he didn't, Kevin didn't talk to them all the time. They also, like I said, didn't talk to Angel or James until much into the investigation. And that is when they said that Jamie actually told them he was the last person to see Kevin alive, not Kayla. And this was never further looked into, even though it was a completely different story. But the family feels like the police believe this case isn't important because he may have been doing drugs like every other person at that festival. And although it's less likely that Kevin actually joined a cult, Many are manipulated into doing so, even today. They have even become virtual. And nowadays, the programming is a bit less harsh. You know, you're not abducted. You are simply talked to until you believe, you know, oh, maybe these cult practices aren't what I used to believe in. You're, you know, taught to kind of look back at your old self and then you learn to escape and be free of the cult yourself. But that doesn't make the actual process of being in the cult any better and it's much harder to get freed than to join. And much like in an abusive relationship, being in a cult begins with love bombing, the overdoing of flattery, the feeling of community and love, and then suddenly all that is ripped away. But what do you believe happened to Kevin that day? Is he still alive? Does he want to be found? Does he possibly 
a homeless man somewhere, possibly in psychosis, a mental break where he does not remember his life, does not remember the numbers, does not know how to get back home or contact anybody. And I think that's why it's so important to actually look at homeless people, first of all, as they are real people and give them, you know, a second of our time. The homeless man that that one witness saw, they could be missing to their family members and that's why we have to be very vigilant about you know making sure that we know the missing people in our area and looking around for strange activity for people who are just acting a bit odd because you know most of the time they're not trying to hurt you when they're in sort of this psychosis mental breakdown they don't know how to control themselves and so at that point you don't have to go up and get involved yourself but make sure you're calling the police make sure you're calling someone to help them and not just looking at them like they're crazy and running away. I truly hope that he sees one of the many projects that his family have done to try to locate him. All the missing persons posters, everything that they have done to try to raise awareness and get him to see it. I hope that he sees it and I hope that, you know, someday soon he realizes that that is his family and that he either needs to just call them, let them know he doesn't want to come home or be reunited with them again because they are so desperately searching and they deserve to have answers. I know I don't usually do many unsolved cases, but I felt like this one was important. It's, you know, a more recent case and I believe we can still find him and I believe that he is still alive out there. So please keep your eyes peeled. Please share his picture around. Please keep your good thoughts for him and his family. And I just realized that my microphone was not on for this entire thing, so I'm so sorry if the audio was bad today. Just know it will be better in the next video. But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough, and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay?